if you see your client as a partner and not as an enemy, then you can really move mountains. And uh, that's what we're doing now. Business of Architecture, episode 423. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with Matthias Holvich, who is the principal and founder of New York architecture firm HWKM Architecture. He's a published author and he is the co-founder of Architizer.com. His work has been published in publications such as Wallpaper, The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Mark, Balwell, Dwell, and of course the Architectural Digest. So Matthias's career has been really fascinating. He's worked with a number of internationally acclaimed architects. He's worked for Rem Coolhouse uh, in Rotterdam. He worked at Einzelman. He worked with Diller and Scofidio. And he'll talk about some of these experiences in this conversation and how that shaped his approach to architecture and his approach to the business aspects of architecture. So in this conversation, Matthias and I discuss HWKN's inception, how the business grew. We talk about Architizer, how that led to a deep understanding of media and publishing and how those two relate with the world of actually running an architecture practice. And we talk about Matthias's and HWKN's approach to working with developer clients and how they're able to deliver and produce quite experimental, uh, innovative solutions, particularly in such a fierce and competitive uh, commercial environment. We discuss how he's been able to balance having a research and design arm into the company uh, and many other entrepreneurial activities. So really fascinating conversation um, from a great architect and entrepreneur. So sit back, relax and enjoy Matthias Holvich. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. Hello, Enix Sears here with a special announcement for you, our diehard podcast fan. Listen on for a life-changing opportunity for the right person. I have a question for you. Did you know that Ryan Willard, who's currently our Director of Education and Consulting here at Business of Architecture, started out listening to the podcast? Well, we here at Business of Architecture, were looking for a new team member. And I have a feeling that our next team member currently listens to the Business of Architecture podcast. Perhaps you enjoy architecture, but something tells you that it isn't right for you or you're looking for another opportunity. In any case, we're currently hiring a detail-oriented, enthusiastic person to be the glue that holds our team together by managing internal project deadlines and communication. If you or someone you know is a spreadsheet wizard, thrives on lists and deadlines, and knows how to organize and influence a team, and you want to learn and grow professionally as well as personally, you could be our next project manager. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash PM position to find out more. Once again, that's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash PM position without spaces to find out more. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Matthias, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm very excited to be here today. Brilliant. Fantastic to have you. Now, you are based in New York. You are the founding principal of HWKN. You were originally born in, you were from Germany originally. Yes, exactly. Um, I was uh, born and raised in Germany, and, uh, but left uh, more than 25 years ago. So halfway through my life, I'm already now on the way. Fantastic. And what was it then that, that brought you to New York in the first place? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it wasn't to set up a business. <laughs> yeah, no, I had many different contact points uh, to New York. The first one was in, I believe, 89 uh, as a tourist. And I was just mesmerized by the city. And you imagine I come from like Munich, very beautiful, but slightly boring city. Going to Manhattan at the time in the uh, end of 80s, it was like this incredible energetic but also crazy and dirty and weird kind of place. 
And I was immediately so intrigued that I wanted to come back. And I came back and back and back and back. And after five tries, I finally made it to be here. Amazing. And so did you, you studied in New York to begin with and then established your career and Yes, slightly different, actually. So all of my study was in uh, Munich and I got the opportunity through a incredible coincidence where I did a summer school in Venice and Ricardo Scofidio from Dillo Scofidio was one of the tutors, one of the teachers. And uh, that was a time where they were still in the cradle of their career. And uh, after the session in Venice, I asked if I can do an uh, internship. And um, Ricardo basically said, like, look, we're a very small shop and so on, but apply and but give me your number. And he left. And then three weeks later, I still remember uh, there was a voicemail on a very old recorder uh, at my home in Munich. And it basically said, hello. This is Ricardo Scofidio. If you still want to work for us, be here on Monday. And that's a Friday. <laughs> so I packed my things. I moved to New York for half a year. And I did this internship at this incredible place mm. uh, with Rick and Liz and Paul Lewis. And that was the beginning of my love uh, with New York. And also, actually, the door opened for architectural opportunity. Because mm. uh, my education was very technical. Uh, was very German, kind of solid, but nothing about poetics and architecture yeah. and form and inspiration. And that opened the door. So it, and it's really interesting to have an experience like like that and, and work with a practice like Diller and Scofidio. Um, and then just looking at the caliber of your of your work as well. And it's, it's you know, certainly pushing the boundaries of a form and computation and the processes that you're that you're utilizing. Um, what what was it that led you to setting up your own practice and how have you has it always been like this or you know was there were there early days where you were doing much more um conservative work shall we say yeah so i was lucky i was able to avoid uh, a little bit the conservative work because mm -hmm. after dillo scofidio um, i worked for peter eisenman then i worked for rem kohlhaas and then I took a little bit of a out time um, just to really find my own self. And I went a little, a little bit into internet technology and concept engineering. But then when I had met my former business partner, Mark, uh, we started a company and uh, yes, we had to earn money and uh, there were parallel process. One thing uh, we were putting attention into high end residential work. Uh, that came a little bit more through the networks for Mark. And uh, I was always pushing the envelope and I was looking for other opportunities. And somehow we got into the pop-up world. Uh, so we designed the Mini Cooper rooftop uh, in New York. And that immediately established us as like uh, cool architects, interesting forms and embedded in this kind of brand world and uh, uh, architectural expressions. And uh, that helped us to immediately establish ourselves, not as ones to go to, to do a whatever building. Mm -hmm. uh, we were suddenly positioned already as the ones that do aspirational work. And uh, from there on, actually, a couple of years later, we got the inv invitation for um, the project at the Museum of Modern Art PS1, the Young Architects Program. And when we won that, uh, competition and we built our project that's called Wendy uh, that opened the door that we were established as uh, a firm that does extraordinary work. Amazing and and how did you how do you approach clients then did was it um, very much a case of once you had kind of these high profile wins under your belt that clients were starting to be attracted to you or was it more that you were being strategic and we need to be talking with these kinds of people I think our interests and missions would be in alignment and then you went after in a kind of proactive marketing approach how did it how did you start to build up your client base? So my recommendation is what you just said, be strategic <laughs> about it. We weren't, <laughs> we were like, just how do we get work? And we just went everywhere. And, uh, but I think that's also in architecture, you never really know in the end where things come from mm. when you build your career. I think later on, you can become much more targeted and uh, strategic. 
And that's actually now what we're doing. We're actually vetting our clients. We say no to people who we don't believe are in line with our vision and also maybe don't have the muscle in the end to pull off a project of uh, relevance. Um, but early on, I mean, we literally just grabbed everything that we could. But what we were always good at is finding special moments that we can make super special uh, without breaking the bank, without mm -hmm. scaring our client. And uh, I think the process to get there where we included our clients very heavily also helped us to overcome, to overwhelm them with innovation. Uh, I still remember uh, when we got invited to the Innovation Center bid for the University of Pennsylvania, uh, we first have to present ourselves and to win against four other competitors. And we actually totally gambled uh, because um, I had to present to the board and uh, everyone expected us to present the science. And uh, I was like, this is our firm and this is the vision and this is about innovation. And now I believe you want to see the science. And then everyone was like, yes, yes. I was like, I have to totally, utterly disappoint you. I'm not going to show you anything because we believe that innovation comes out of collaboration. And I know that you are the right partners to work with us to come up with the most relevant project that is specific for your institution. And we got it. Amazing. <laughs> totally amazing. And then we actually, uh, we did this creative workshops that uh, the university was not used to. And we put like 10 different designs in front of them. And we're like, okay, here are dots and here are markers and let's go. Here's Red Bull. And everyone started to work on these kind of different ideas. And what was so exciting in two workshop sessions, we were able to come up uh, with multiple designs that uh, became more and more relevant. And then at the very end, we were like, okay, here are the dots and now put the dots down onto the ones that you think should be the one that we built. And uh, everyone put the dots down. Uh, but then I still remember Anne Papador, head of real estate, amazing, amazing person, uh, very visionary, but the powerhouse at Penn. Uh, she was the last one walking around with a dot and uh, I was just looking. He was like, where's the dot going? And then she was like, Matthias, you do know that not every dot is the same. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's the one we built. And, uh, but then she also told me, it's like, Matthias, I love this form. It's going to be amazing, but make sure we can afford it and fill it up with program and meaning. Hmm. And, um, and that's, that was really for me, the proof is, if you see your client as a partner mm -hmm. and not as an enemy, then you can really move mountains. And uh, that's what we're doing. Now. So, so, so tell me a little bit about how you like what, what's at the heart of a good collaboration and at the heart of ensuring that there is this partnership between client and it's not, you know, either the client has all the power and they're just directing you what to do. And then we're the architects just feeling like a commodity and just having to draft and draw something that we're not really in, in alignment with versus this kind of creative collaboration where they're there's energy and ideas coming out. How, how do you, what, what are the, some of the foundational pieces to have that kind of relationship? Yeah, and uh, I think many, many architects actually go into that role of the service provider, right? Yep. And the client tells you what they want. And then it's like, yeah, I know the data, how big and da, da, da. Um, but what is so interesting is when we just have to be very open uh, and seeing what's changing in society. And if we can make a case that what we're designing has a relevance in society and supporting basically our client and what the client wants to do is, right, they want to have a successful project. They want to lease it very fast, want to make some money. And uh, hopefully there's a little bit more intention behind it, maybe be more sustainable, maybe be more social. But finally, these different things and some of the agenda are going to be obvious, other ones maybe not but always helping the client to make that understandable. And uh, also what we very early realized is that when you create a building that people fall in love with, where they start to take selfies, where they are proud to go into the building, it makes the building more successful. And there is a clear metrics uh, that people photograph, right? Go onto the internet and just Google architecture and you see, is it gonna be the boring buildings? No. Uh, are this the uh, extraordinary ones or the historic ones or the ones which are just beautiful or have some special elements to it? 
these are the ones who people embrace and really document and as soon people take a selfie with the building it's for them it's like i like this place right now the most amazing thing is what's happening now is that through um, the last two years everything is changing and nobody has the real answers anymore we don't know exactly anymore how the future office looks like, how future retail is, live-work relationships, um, urban conditions have shifted into suburbia, now it's shifting back into the urban world uh, in many occasions. Now this is a moment for pure creativity in the architectural world and I really hope that we are not fucking it up, right, in terms of not taking this opportunity serious and really developing new means of living, working, playing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and this is kind of the greatest moment in architecture right now, because we see clients coming to us with just questions and without answers. And uh, we are now basically here to help them. To, to find these answers. What, what sorts of things have, that, particularly like in development and you know, developers in, in New York who are in, operating there in one of the sort of fiercest real estate environments on the planet, um, what, what kinds of concerns or pains or problems are you finding that your clients are having now that they didn't have, say, two, three years ago pre, in a pre-COVID world? Yeah, the developers have a problem that they have empty real estate. And uh, it's empty on the one side that maybe people have not leased space, but even if people have leased space, it's not fully utilized. And uh, that should scare them, right? Because as soon as the lease is up, are people going to recalibrate where they have their office spaces or the size of the office spaces? And all of that needs answers. And uh, I cannot, uh, let's say the best example for me is actually right now in the UK, uh, we won a competition for a 400,000 square foot office building. And uh, for this competition, and we were competing against awesome firms, right? uh, firms that I aspire to. And uh, we basically said, uh, what happened through COVID, we're living now in the year 2035, because everything that we predicted to happen, happened so much faster now, remote work, sustainability crisis, and then, and, and. And uh, there are three mega trends that come together for us. The one is hub and spoke, right? So that, yeah, people can work from home, co-working spaces, wherever, but then sometimes they come back to the headquarter. The second one is uh, hoteling, where you see a lot of new services going into these office buildings to make them competitive and make them convenient and that people can have more flexibility and use uh, and utilize these buildings differently. And the third one comes actually through some of my advisors. They're talking about the shift of people's uh, wants, desires uh, to choose for a job. And it used to be a generation before 2000 where people wanted to have one job, just run the career and then retire. In the last 20 years, it was about purposeful work. Mm -hmm. Now, the next generation is about experience. The experience of your work, that it's fulfilling, that you meet other people, that your career is progressing. Now, what we were doing, if you combine hub and spoke, hoteling and experience, we come to something new that we call resorting. What we are designing right now is the first work resort. And that's going to be in London. It's going to be a 400,000 square foot office building, entirely different in terms of the expression of the building is exotic because why would you go to a resort that's boring, right? A resort needs to have extraordinary physical attributes. The programming, it's all calibrated about interfacing with the community, market hall, big open spaces, where it's a blur between inside and outside. Mm -hmm. uh, we maximized uh, terrace spaces because even in the UK, you think it's raining all the time, but it doesn't actually. You can be outside uh, quite a bit. Uh, so that uh, you work, you can make a choice. Do you work from inside, outside, or in the between spaces? And then we have flagship uh, elements about the lobby is a welcoming center. Uh, the bike storage is a transport activity center um, where you can also get your rowing board and uh, your rollerblades and your bike and all the kind of things, right? Because it's also activities that are actually important for the commute. And then we have these kind of flagship connectivity moments with private chef connecting people with great meals uh, because food always connects us. Mm. And when you think about like a great resort experience, 
uh, Club Med, right, or Robinson and so on, you go there and you first it's like, oh, is this going to be weird? And then like 24 hours later, you met new friends and uh, you suddenly surf, uh, surfing and doing things you have never done before. And all of this people pay a lot of money for, right? And uh, when you th see that as an inspiration about how we can retool our office buildings, that they become aspirational places that people want to be at and find all the reasons and build the reasons that people come there automatically, then that's basically the success. And that's uh, what we're doing in Amazing. London. So, so do you think that clients were being this open to experimentation or, or visioneering like this pre-COVID pre or has this really come from a, um, from, from a distinct pain and these kinds of uncertainties? Yeah, I think uh, you have, of course, Curry's clients, and we're very, very lucky about our London clients. I cannot reveal them yet, but uh, when you see their names, you're going to be like, yeah, these guys, they always have to be in, at the forefront, and now they're just supercharging and they're going further. But also we're seeing for clients who were not so um, curious before, right? They're seeing that now the real estate is in, in under pressure, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the pressure is actually building up. Right, uh, right now we have uh, the war in the Ukraine, we have sustainability, supply chain, prices going up, lending goes up. Right? And now it's the thing is like, are you going to make your building more simple and save money? Mm -hmm. Then you have another boring B and C class building in the city or you go the other way. Can you maybe be more efficient with the spaces that are being utilized, but more extraordinary on these kind of buildings, but then also be hyper, hyper, hyper sustainable? Uh, because what's so interesting is the next generation that's going to be in the workforce, they're going to be very critical about uh, who has done the right things for the environment and who has not done it. And uh, that's going to be uh, all about long-term value mm -hmm. uh, that uh, has to be secured uh, through sustainability. Um, so how, do you, how have you gone about finding these kinds of curious clients, as, as you put it? And, and I know you can't disclose who you're working with in, in London at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but, but obviously that, that kind of ability for you guys to walk in and be able to create an enormous amount of value because you're now understanding a very unique set of problems and you're able to think from the client's perspective you're able to think from the tenant's perspective you're able to think from the you know from the end users and everyone who's experienced in the building and come up with this uh, uh, a, a concept which is very plugged into you know what's happening now how do you how do you find clients who are who are like that mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we do is like constantly kind of reading what's going on, of course, in the real estate world. We're very proactive mm -hmm. about just finding developers, finding people, start to approach them. But then we're also making sure that our PR machine works, right? right? Because uh, my belief is that people need to see your name three times be before they have interest in you. And that should be a newsletter, a magazine, and hopefully a friend telling them. It's like, oh, I got this, are cool people um, or a colleague or at the conference, right? So. You need to build a cloud around you, uh, which is the, the, the reality, which is unfortunate, right? I would hope that just talent would rule the yeah. world, uh, but it's also just connections and uh, the word of mouth and also PR is part of it. Uh, but that's why they have to use uh, all of that together uh, to be able to reach uh, these different uh, people and companies. And um, of course, in Europe, uh, there's a lot of competition culture. Uh, that means you first have to meet the people, then they have to invite you, and then you have to do the competition, then you have to win it. Uh, but the good thing is right now that innovative concept win these competitions. Uh, so that helps us right now to nurture people from just knowing them into real clients. Uh, in the US now, uh, we also had competitions which were not official ones. Uh, they were smaller ones just to see what other architects are doing. And um, yeah, we won two recently, one of them in Austin, uh, one of them in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. In Washington, D.C., we're doing now the tallest uh, timber residential building uh, in the region and uh, hyper sustainable live work attributes. So also here again, uh, what won is hyper sustainability, social activation and meaningful architecture. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to see that right now uh, we go beyond the boring box. You mentioned there the kind of the PR machine's got to be working and that you create a kind of cloud around you. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the elements of, of that cloud? Yeah, so um, as a full disclosure, right, so I'm also founder of Archetizer, uh, which started like 12 years ago, where we always had the mission to promote great young talents uh, to become relevant in the world. And uh, so good thing for many of our other colleagues, uh, because we were able to promote them. The bad thing is, since we were the co-founders, we did not dare to promote ourselves. <laughs> But at least uh, we did learn a lot um, what people respond to. And um, now um, we work in this PR agency. Uh, we have a very constant stream of newsletters and uh, email campaigns. Uh, but then also we had, for example, an exhibition in Berlin where we wanted to really push our ideas out into the open. We called it Shape Tomorrow. And uh, it was even through COVID, it was well intended. Uh, we got a lot of people reporting about it. Yesterday, actually, we just won an award for it. Uh, and uh, so I think you don't want to create something artificial, right, where you just try to promote something that it's not reflecting your capabilities and also mm -hmm. your vision. Uh, but through, for example, this exhibition, which, uh, I mean, I'm still like at awe that we pulled it off because it was really epic, uh, beautiful, like nine mega columns that distorted into cool forms that people could engage with and tell us what they want from the future city. And uh, and by winning this award, we, we won actually two awards in one, which was a public choice uh, and then also the jury, uh, which for me was like the proof uh, we created something really relevant uh, that inspired people. And, uh, and then that, of course, goes out into the press and people see that uh, we're pushing the envelope. And uh, this is, of course, also our position right? as a firm. Uh, we call ourselves these days a um, boutique innovation mm -hmm. firm uh, because uh, we want to push the envelope. And that's, of course, then aligned with an exhibition and all the other things so, that we so, do. So which, which came first, Archetizer or, or your practice? Uh, first, the praxis, um, and uh, it was well timed that we started the firm when the recession hit in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was basically like we start and now we have to stop again, uh, but we kind of trickled along. Uh, but that's when we started basically Archetizer um, during that time because we raised a little bit of money and uh, we were basically uh, at the moment uh, at the cross crossing war, uh, moment, right, where the internet became really mm -hmm. relevant uh, with a lot of, let's say, also communication tools, uh, but we didn't see yet anyone doing that for architects and, um, yeah, took off uh, really nicely. Uh, and then uh, later on, architecture kicked up again. Amazing. And how did you manage to keep these two businesses running? There must have been, like, you know, just just mentally being able to separate and organize yourself how did you how did you program at that in and and was there one that you were like okay well we're gonna have to put a ceo or put someone running it in 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 place and let go of it how did you manage the two businesses and and how are they synergetic with each other yeah, now it was interesting. Um, so I started uh, HR Ken Hawken uh, with Mark together uh, and also Archetizer. Uh, and then there were a couple of other people there, Alex Steele uh, and Ben were with us as founders. Uh, but we were the two uh, which were more into the day-to-day -day business. And uh, what very early started when Archetizer became very successful, uh, that Mark uh, was very attracted to be the head of Archetizer. He is a person who is uh, very well in mm -hmm. presenting and uh, kind of connecting emotionally to people and uh, was kind of a natural. And then I was basically running the architecture firm. Uh, and that's how it worked out actually for many, many years. Uh, and then um, he raised some money for Archetizer and then there were a couple of issues uh, that he had to work through. Uh, ultimately, he stepped down from Archetizer and then he also left uh, HWCM. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but uh, at least for these kind of 10 years, uh, it worked really well. Uh, but I do have to tell people uh, a warning, uh, starting two businesses <laughs> more or less at the same time. And also, the one is an architecture firm, which is a hourly service firm yeah. in a way. And then something like Archetizer is like technology and media. They have nothing to do with each other, even that it was dealing with architects. Um, 
and it's really, really hard to do two businesses at once. So uh, think twice <laughs> before you really do yeah, it. Yeah, that's, that's, that, I mean, that's, 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 that's quite extraordinary. What's your relationship now with Archetizer? Are you still an, an owner of it or? Yeah, so I'm still owner, but uh, it was actually just announced last week. It got sold uh, to Mature Bank. Uh, so it has a new home now. Uh, which is great, uh, puts a lot of, uh, let's say, technology and people and resources behind it. Uh, so uh, now other people, and I mean, I haven't been really actively involved for mm -hmm. many years, but other people now going to take charge. Uh, but also David Weber, who is already the CEO for Archetizer for many years, uh, he's going to continue the leadership. And um, yeah, I think uh, it's going to be... A uh, great future for it, still promoting basically talents and making architecture more mm -hmm. relevant and making it more popular uh, because that was really our what vision. Was, what were some of the key lessons that you learned from Architizer that has informed your own PR and your own the, 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 the cloud, as you describe it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, very early we actually looked at our data sheets, what pictures people clicked on the most and uh, like 10 years ago it was all about cantilevers <laughs> and uh, we're like oh people are loving cantilevers right <laughs> and then uh, and we were just able to see shifts of after like five years people couldn't see cantilevers anymore right and then it was like more semi-organic forms so uh, it's just interesting to see how people just respond to mm -hmm. pictures which are of course a reflection on the architecture and the vision uh, what there is uh, we see that people are incredible passionate about uh, some of the work, right? They do research, what is good for our city, what has worked in other places. So what for me the learning is from Architizer is that you want to create really extraordinary places uh, for people to be at. Uh, you want to, but also be very open and communicate everything around into the community uh, because this kind of there was always a sense of secrecy around architecture, right? So an architect is like, okay, I disappear. Now I have my ideas. Here's a building. Let's do it. And then also there's always this suspicion that the developers always try to pull over like the community and also a city. And we all have to understand that we're all participants in the creation. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to talk to each other, engage with each other, but also excite each other. And uh, over time now, uh, we decided or I decided that for our firm, then we had to be very sharp about who we are and what we do. And uh, so the big vision, right, is about uh, innovative architecture. But an underlining one, when you look at all of our work, I call it unforgettable buildings. And unforgettability comes out of three different properties. The one is contextual materials, because I want to make the context better and uh, not overpower it, right? I want to lift up uh, neighboring buildings and uh, the, build, uh, the city at large. Then it's about emotions. And for me, the key emotion is joy, right? So when people come to a building that I designed with my team, it needs to be just, oh my God, this is like fun. I want to be here. This is great. And the last one, it's, uh, it needs to be novel. It needs mm -hmm. to be different. And if you combine basically uh, contextual, so familiarity, emotions and novelty, then you create unforgettable buildings. Uh, and that's basically how we separate ourselves from all the other ones around us. Uh, and that's also, I think, very important Amazing. that you do find something that becomes um, yeah. your own and, uh, and also a belief, uh, of course, what you think the world should be about. Mm -hmm. But they never be stuck, right? Uh, we do try to update ourselves and we always experiment. And sometimes I'm like, oh my God, we're doing this experiment again. Uh, it's, this firm is already 15 years old, but this is very, very important to refresh. Mm -hmm. And our latest refresh is actually, we just got a commission in the metaverse. And uh, six weeks ago, I was like, oh, metaverse, do I really have to get into it? <laughs> now I'm like, Oh my God, thankfully we're doing it um, because it's such an interesting field to experiment for us as architects right now. And um, yeah, my team has fun. Amazing. With it. Before we dive into the, the, the metaverse, um, I'm, 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 I really love this description of the, of the, of the cloud and the marketing. And, and actually, the, what you're talking about here is that there, you know, 
And I, I know that you, you kind of look at things like Instagram or how Instagrammable is a building and there's a lot of thought leadership and conversation that the, your practice is generating um, about how to, to view architecture and the value of architecture, particularly from uh, like a client's perspective. There's also this kind of strong design and research elements to the practice and the kind of intellectual rigor that, that drives through it. How do you take those sorts of yeah, your own research and make sure that it's not hidden from view. Because actually this is, this is part of the, you know, what a lot of architects dream of having is like a, is a big research component to their practices. And, you know, it seems like you guys are actually doing that and that that research arm is actually something which is a powerful marketing arm, if you like. It's something that's starting mm -hmm. conversations and bringing in the right kinds of, um, uh, of, of clients and starting those, those relationships. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, and there is definitely something about like a wealth of knowledge that never kind of spills out right. into the world. Um, but uh, I do give quite some lectures. Um, so I think this year I've given like mm -hmm. probably 10 um, and uh, always try to come up with uh, like the most relevant topics. Um, the one was basically the shared economy recently for Bayerische Hausbau in Munich. I've talked about Shape Tomorrow, um, about all of these kind of visions on the future of work, live and play. Um, but then, um, yeah, I, I don't know. There's there's a lot of uh, knowledge that you just build up uh, and you pull that into your projects when you need to. Uh, but uh, to put all out there, we probably have to reinitiate a book project <laughs> just to put things into context. Um, but um, it's uh, it's a lot of effort, right? And um, but it's very very beneficial, of course, when mm -hmm. people see it how you do it. Um, but I also must say, uh, we have a tendency, and actually way back when with my former business partner, we always discussed it, we actually looked into a unique way how we present our process, how we come up with our designs. And um, of course, for weeks we design and we come up with different ways how forms are being generated and so on. But at the very end, we tried to boil it down to... Here's the simple mess. We cut this off. We add this on. Here we put in the facade. Boom. And uh, so it works actually really, really well, except that sometimes clients think it's so easy <laughs> because I show them basically, it's like, this is our high rise in New Jersey. Click, click, click. Here it is. They're like, oh, this is really cool. This is easy. It's beautiful. It's like, yeah, but it took us six months right, to, <laughs> to come up with something that simple. Um, but that's also something uh, what we at least try to do um, to not make architecture more complex uh, in terms of mm -hmm. the communication. It's very complex as a trade. It's very complex to build everything behind it. Uh, but just to help people to understand, uh, we try to break it down a little bit more easily. Got it. Um, so, so interestingly, you're saying that there's a there's a huge amount of body of work and knowledge that we'll never get to see or or know about, and it will kind of it will raise its head when needed and appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. And that actually asking these these pertinent questions are very are very important. Um, jumping into what you were just talking about with the metaverse. How do you see that this is an opportunity for architects? Is this something that architects or firms should be taking seriously? Is it a kind of golden time now where we can position ourselves as early adopters and get our, you know, literally get the kind of real estate, the digital real estate? Is it something worth pursuing? Yeah, and I think uh, what's interesting is maybe not even adopters, it's maybe right. shapers, right? Uh, because uh, what is so interesting, uh, web. Uh, 1.0 and 2.0 was all about technology, transaction, and two-dimensionality. And Web 3.0 is three-dimensional and as an immersive experience. And um, architects are perfect uh, to support that with uh, new ideas. And uh, the people who contacted us, it's called PAC, uh, PAX World, PAX, uh, out of uh, Switzerland. And uh, what we, they just asked us to basically create a destination building and there are four architects doing four different destinations in one of their worlds. And uh, we just asked them for a brief and we're like, yeah, we have a dimension and so on. But otherwise, yeah, we don't know. I mean, it's like, it's the meta world. We have to come up with solutions and ideas and so on. And then we looked into, do we need stairs, right? And uh, we actually settled with ideas. It's like, we do create a ramp, uh, which is steeper. It, 
can be whatever kind of thing, but we didn't want to just have people um, just jump from one space to the other one. We wanted to make it a little bit more of a real experience. And uh, when we presented it to the team, they were super enthusiastic about it. Uh, our design even has an expression of structure, uh, which is like, you don't need a structure, uh, but uh, it really helps you to make the link into how the experience translates from our typical mm -hmm. experiences. And when you think about like folders, right? When that came up uh, on, I, I don't know if Apple or Microsoft came up with folders first, but how, how banal is it that it's like the folder that you had, right, uh, in your drawer, uh, but that's now what we use in the computer because it just helps us to link yes. the two things together. And um, and then what I also really hope uh, that it's a democratic mm -hmm. place right, where everyone is invited. It's not exclusive just to the few once again. Uh, things that we have seen also with the Internet uh, and with uh, some of the uh, kind of, I don't know, the, the, the kind of manipulations uh, that are happening uh, in Web 2.0. Uh, hopefully, uh, there's another world that we can shape. And uh, most architects are idealists, as long as they don't work for big corporate uh, monsters, uh, which also you have a couple of some bad players yeah. in the architecture world. Uh, but I think uh, general architects are, I, I believe, uh, they have good intentions. So let's uh, let them play there and come up with good stuff. I love it. How do you know when to say no to a client? Uh, <laughs> do, do, you ever, do, you, do you ever do you ever get clients that come come to you with really outlandish ideas? Then you're like, mm, actually, this I'm not sure that you guys have got the means for this, or you know, <laughs> that maybe they've been attracted they've been attracted to the innovation and the experimentation, and actually, you've got to be quite discerning to know when somebody's genuine and serious. How do you how do you do that? Yeah, so first, uh, we, of course, were, look at the work, what they do. Uh, we also try to just talk to people who have maybe worked with them before. Uh, but uh, I have one example, and I hope that client is not going to listen to it, but it's actually an ex-client. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually in Germany. Um, uh, I, I talked to them for years, super nice people, and, um, and then we got included into the bigger group. And uh, it was actually a very small project, um, just a couple of buildings, I think originally there were three smaller buildings uh, in a very restricted neighborhood. And um, so we started and we looked, it's like, oh, we can split the buildings into eight. Uh, and now we take the buildings and now we can just like slightly shift them very simply and so on. Uh, because what uh, in Germany we're always fighting is the kind of rational that's happening everywhere. Like architects are kind of super systematic and then it just becomes very easily boring. Mm -hmm. And when you look, for example, at our project in Munich, Macherei, uh, we intentionally shifted these buildings slightly and it's just amazing. I was there just last week again and you just feel it. There's like an amazing power of when these volumes are in the right angle against each other or with each other. Yeah. Right, so we, we tried to do the same thing and uh, I worked actually personally over a whole weekend of moving these little volumes and you have setback rules and area rules and so on and it perfectly worked and we're presenting it and then they're like, oh, oh, yeah, interesting, interesting. But you know what, Matthias, uh, you shouldn't forget that people need order. Why don't you just align them in 90 degrees? And we're like, okay, that's it. Here's your other architect. We find one for you. We are not a match. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's, that's kind of the thing, right? Uh, you have to, and we have given money back to people where oh. we realize it's like, this is not working out mm -hmm. and because life is too short, waste of energy. And if we, if I don't, if I cannot stand behind a design and the building, I just not going to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Real, that's, that's really interesting. You, you've actually ref refund the client's money when the, the, the relationship is not a fit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Love it. Um, mm -hmm. So, talking about money, um, how does the practice? How are you? How are you organized in order to be able to say allocate a lot of resource and funds into doing um, research and and development and and remain profitable? What sorts of systems do you have internally to organize yourself and to keep the practice profitable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. For us, every project is considered a research project because we never like open our drawer and say like, oh, we have done this before, let's do it again. 
Um, so hopefully then, of course, our fee is able to afford it. And mm -hmm. then what is so absolutely fascinating, which I love to, that would be actually a really good book to show at some point what project inspired which project. <laughs> and I can tell you, uh, for example, the project we're doing right now in London, and hopefully very soon I can tell you, uh, it has some original DNA in research that we did in New York, mm -hmm. where we looked at all of these historic buildings from the 30s and before, which are all the buildings that people love, the Chrysler Building, the Wall Street One, and uh, Empire, and Flatiron, and so on. And we actually reinvented these buildings uh, just by being inspired by the classic proportions, but with new methodologies. And that actually traveled into our design in London. Uh, but not because we thought we want to copy it, but it was a methodology that we developed way back when, uh, and now we were able to apply it. Right? So basically, we see everything as research, but then we also were really, really lucky. At some point, we work hired us to come up with uh, WeLive 2.0, and we had a two-year R&D contract with them, mm -hmm. where we developed any kind of different floor plan in architecture. and. Uh, I probably could claim that I have designed most different apartment topologies than any other architect in America. And uh, we continue to add actually to it because right now we work with iLive and uh, we're doing our own uh, apartment topology right now, which we call Flex. Uh, and uh, that, of course, uh, I actually have a huge board, which we call the apartment matrix. Every new topology we're just plugging in, and then at some point we go back, this is good here, this is bad, and so on. Uh, and with this, we can always kind of nurture our own knowledge and um, kind of push it ahead uh, where we can, uh, but not just sit there and say, like, now we have to come up with something innovative, and how much money do we put into this? Mm -hmm. It's always part of maybe an additional effort in our typical project uh, design time has um have you ever thought about or uh, ventured into different forms of revenue generation for the practice so perhaps being involved in development or perhaps even developing your own software platforms or some of the technology that you're utilizing which has then become a tool in itself yeah so one thing we have in project discussions right now when we do commission when we get commissions is equity participation mm -hmm. uh, that part of our fee it goes basically into ownership of uh, the building uh, where after five years when it's done right you very likely have a 200 to 300 percent uh, percent uh, upside uh, which is great uh, if you don't need it for cash flow uh, the other thing is that we also have license agreements uh, because we did prototype very innovative new apartment topologies. Uh, one of them is in Germany, uh, where when they build now another apartment that's based on our intellectual property, mm -hmm. they pay us a thousand euro. Uh, hopefully they're building a um, thousand or ten thousand. Uh, that would uh, be really nice for us. Then we also have a um, how do a Rahmenvertrag, which is basically a long-term contract with a client, where we're designing prefabricated office buildings in Germany, and uh, we have a set rule uh, where we know this is how big the building is. This is our contract, but because we're doing it more often, every time we're doing it now, we become more efficient, and with this we have a much higher upside mm -hmm. uh, in terms of earning. And then, um, yeah, we also uh, started another company, which is called Flex. And uh, that's actually where we try to become co-developers. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to develop software, which is going to be operational and social engagement software. And um, let's see how this is all going to work out. But uh, there's definitely always a little bit like a curiosity is how can we fix actually the challenges of architecture? Because it's an incredible underpaid profession. Mm -hmm. Uh, for clients, it's always high risk when we get involved, but in the end, when it all works out, it's a big upside that we as architects never participate in it. Uh, and that's what we also try to slowly but surely change. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, it's not easy. But that's I mean that's that's really interesting and very innovative to to hear that you know you're you know, negotiating ne negotiating license fees and negotiating um, some of the upside, particularly with some of with, with develop with developments. It's never led you to want to be the sole developer yourself. And is, is that what Flex is about, where you're then locating the sites and then doing the activity of the developer as well? 
Yeah, I don't think that we're going to be sole developers, I, more like co-developers. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a very, very, very high respect uh, for developers. That is a nerve-wracking, complicated, <laughs> very challenging uh, job you can do. And uh, of course, higher upsides that, uh, than architects, but also more risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, no, I think uh, I want to stay in my lane, especially after Architizer, right? Uh, that was far out of our lane. It all worked out. It was super interesting. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'd rather have really good relationships with developers and then participate maybe deeper in some of the, the value uh, chain. Amazing. If you were to speak to yourself 15 years ago or when you were on the you know just setting up the business what advice would you have given yourself good question i actually have thought about many times would i start an architecture firm again <laughs> <laughs> and i was like oh my god it would be so nice to just have a job and get your paycheck and then just go on vacation and not think about things uh, but then it's also incredible rewarding uh, it's nerve-wracking and rewarding i think if like covid was tough uh, right now, the crisis, it's the next recession or at least some kind of uh, cooling down period going to come. Uh, it's going to be nerve wracking again. Right. So when you're an owner, uh, I feel very responsible for my team, mm -hmm. for the well-being of everyone. Um, so there's so much more that uh, you carry with you. Uh, but it's also amazing just to realize that you can shape your future. You can shape buildings. You can shape cities. You can be really part of it. Uh, so uh, even though sometimes I question myself, I would always say to people now, try it and do it. And uh, even if you fail, at least you did it and you can always go back to a more safe environment. Um, but I think the two things that I would do different. Uh, the first one is um, business partners are really, really hard to find. And when you find them, it's also really hard to make it work. Mm -hmm. And uh, with my partner I had with Mark, uh, I was very surprised in the end how it ended. Um, it could have been great, uh, but it didn't uh, do so well. Uh, but uh, that was something I should have seen a little bit earlier yeah. and maybe address it a little bit earlier um, to foresee it. Uh, we did have some very good um, agreement between us, uh, but there were loopholes uh, that were utilized uh, so that it didn't turn out that fair. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, just have really, really good advice uh, and also always see the future that uh, you maybe have to shift things yeah. and always see that as a possibility. And I was very lucky. I got my license on time. I got my citizenship on time and I was uh, just prepared to take over the firm on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, but that were like lucky moments. Uh, and I think I should have planned it uh, or I would now tell people to really plan it a little bit more actively. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, with, um, let's say the nurturing relationships with clients, uh, always be open to listen what they like about you and what they don't like about you or where you maybe see uh, challenges. And um, like, like the weirdest irony for us was, right, so the company used to be called Holwich Kushner, but we always called it HW Ken. And uh, then there was this moment where we were like, nah, we should push actually Hobbit Kushner a little bit for more, uh, more ahead into the game. Uh, and that was the moment when Trump won uh, with uh, Kushner as an advisor. <laughs> and, uh, and we stick with the name and we should have never done it because we did really have business challenges uh, because of our name. Now, here's my recommendation. Never ever use your own name or your business partner's name. Come up with something fun which is also really important because the long-term value of your firm uh, is also based on the brand. At some point, right, um, you retire or you die, right? Uh, it will happen to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, when your name is associated to it, uh, the value is in question. And if you have a fantasy name, uh, the value is uh, much more secured. Uh, so that would be my other recommendation. Don't, don't <laughs> choose your name uh, as your business name. And now it's HW Ken. It has no real meaning anymore. Yeah. It's just like Hawken. Uh, and that's really helpful for us at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that would be one more thing to learn from my experiences. Brilliant. Um, just going back to some of your earlier career, pre having set up your own business, and then you, you know, you were saying that you worked for OMA, you worked for Peter Eisenman, and and you had you did your intern with um, Dylan Scafidio as well. We know 
I think you can, we can see some of the design um, influence from those practices and perhaps some of the process and the way that they think about architecture. What have been some of the business lessons that you picked up from those practices? <laughs> that is good. Uh, I think I never, ever, ever heard any one of my former bosses to talk about business. And um, the things that I picked up, which was interesting, at Deleuze Video at the time, they were trying to figure out if they're artists or if they're architects. And they're very different businesses and different value proposition. And yeah. they decided, thankfully, to do the architectural world because they created amazing buildings around the world and they didn't just stay in installations and uh, what they had done uh, quite a bit before. Yeah. Then I think um, with uh, Peter Eisenman, right? I mean, one of the thought leaders in architecture for so many years, um, but uh, his thought leadership was one step ahead of the game and uh, it was really difficult for him to translate it into business. Mm -hmm. uh, so my lesson was there, don't push it that far, always stay in the realm of opportunities so that you can realize your projects. And then working with REM, I think that was just magical because it was a moment uh, in uh, 1996 uh, where from all the theoretical work suddenly it became real and uh, there were amazing uh, commissions uh, that we uh, were working on and seeing at that time that actually this incredible thought leader was able now to translate this into real projects uh, was very, very inspiring. The only thing that I learned from him is that uh, don't make it so complicated to clients because that's what he did <laughs> to the clients. He was very often going against uh, some of the way you would say like, oh, do I go with what the client wants or do I go with what I really believe? And I always believe there's a much more a collaborative avenue to go through. And I think the firm that really hit it is uh, Bjarke Ingels right, yeah. uh, with uh, Bjarke. He really combined incredible visionary architecture, but really developer friendly in a way, uh, but just because he takes them onto a journey. And I think we all can learn a lot from him. Uh, so I think that's a really good lesson that he's teaching us. Absolutely. Brilliant. So what's next for you guys in 2022? Yeah, for us next is uh, actually we are doing our due diligence on a potential recession. Uh, I think everyone should mm -hmm. do it. Uh, we stopped hiring. Uh, we, we're staying where we are. We're compressing uh, rather uh, the work into us. Uh, but the good thing is uh, our books are full for a year. Um, so uh, we're not in any kind of urgent situation. Uh, but uh, I think we all have to really be aware what's happening right now. Uh, and then parallel, uh, we're pushing further a visionary work because um, this is really the moment, right? Uh, we're all just coming out of the COVID crisis, unfortunately going into the next one right now. But uh, uh, just seeing that there is this incredible potential right now to reshape the world uh, is something that um, we're taking very serious uh, as a responsibility and uh, making sure that we continue to build our aspirational qualities so that we have something to offer. Uh, that makes us different than any other architect uh, in the world. Love it. Matthias, thank you very much for that brilliant insight into, into your world, how you work with clients and uh, your business acumen. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for this very inspiring conversation. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.